introduce you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMean 2024. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor David Lay, Fellow of Royal Society from the University of Manchester, who will talk about molecular ratchets and kinetic asymmetry given chemistry direction. Please uh, give us. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, Fratelli. And thanks. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, and, and thanks to Fratelli for the, the chance to come and uh, uh, talk to you all today about the work that we're doing 30 miles away in uh, rainy Manchester. Um, so I'm a synthetic chemist, uh, but um, I hope you're not too scared by that. Uh, um, and I, I tried to find things, uh, uh, a way to, to tell a story about what we do that I hope will uh, be of interest um, uh, to, you, uh, uh, to you all today. So um, uh, we design and make molecules, and particular sorts of molecules that we make are related to um, molecular machines. Um, and uh, of course, the molecular level is very different to the big world. And so the engineering techniques that people use to design machines in the big world simply can't operate at the molecular level um, because the way that math behaves at different length scales is just so uh, different. There's no momentum or inertia at the molecular level. Everything is undergoing stochastic motion. Um, so it's just completely different to trying to use Newtonian mechanics in the, in the big world. So um, we're interested in, in trying to make molecular machines. Uh, we also make molecular knots. That's a side um, puzzle uh, of ours. And Christian, who's online, uh, I know from uh, uh, many excellent knot uh, meetings. So I'm to, uh, to Christian, but I'm not going to talk uh, about those um, about those today. So. Um, this, this one? So there are high hopes for molecular machines. Some people think that they're going to go inside us and cure all kinds of uh, diseases. Um, but there are fears as well. Other people are worried that there's going to be this self-replicating grey goo that's going to wipe out uh, uh, the planet. Um, the general public uh, and even politicians such as this charlatan uh, are aware of the field of molecular machines and um, in his speech to the United Nations in 2019, uh, Boris Johnson asked, will uh, technology help us to beat diseases or will it be tiny robots to replicate in the crevices of our souls? So if uh, even the, the general public and politicians who uh, decide what to do with our, our, our tax pounds and euros and dollars um, uh, are aware of this subject, and it falls upon us in the area to uh, sort out the science facts from the science fiction in this area so that people can make better decisions, both politicians and how they assign our money and voters uh, who can vote on the, the politicians. Um, so there's already been a Nobel Prize award in this area. Uh, in 2016, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded to three of my friends and colleagues, uh, John Pierre Savage, Frank Stella, and Ben Faringa, for their work in this area. And just a very briefest of um, explanations for why they won the Nobel Prize. Um, Savage in the 1980s came up with a way of making uh, mechanically linked uh, architectures, so called tap names and uh, rotaxanes, by using metal uh, template effects to, to bring about uh, threading. The bars didn't really make um, any significant molecular machines, uh, but um, Stoddart uh, followed on from Savage in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, uh, so that's genius was really to recognize that the large amplitude motions that you could get into mechanically into a, a architecture could potentially use, be used for uh, molecular um, uh, uh, machines. Uh, so Stoddart made lots of large amplitude switches and changed the, the, the rings on these sort of uh, 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 tracks, called the motors when they weren't, uh, uh, but they didn't know better at the time. And he made um, all sorts of molecular machines that were based on how people are uh, on shrinking down macroscopic machines, so so-called molecular elevators, 
happy to sign uh, uh, systems. And then Ben Feringa, um, just at the end of the, uh, the last century, made the very first uh, rotary molecular uh, motor. So this is a real uh, molecular motor. This rotor rotates around the scatter. If you shine UV light on it above a certain um, uh, wavelength, above a certain temperature. Uh, but Feringa, again, used these sort of devices, really not as motors, but as switches, and again was inspired to make nanoscale versions of macroscopic machinery, so I think the central um, uh, nano car. So, um, as we've said, the matter behaves very differently at different rate scales, and really, in, in our view, um, the, well, the whole reason that we know that it's possible to shrink the concept of a machine to the molecular level anyway is that there already is a working uh, nanotechnology, it's called biology, and um, the reason that we know that it's possible to shrink machines is, is because this all works uh, 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 great. So it seemed to us, uh, again, while um, Sartre, Feringa, and Savage were um, engaging those sorts of things. So over the last 20 years, we've sort of got a different route and tried to learn how biology um, copes with trying to make machines at the molecular level and follow those principles in design of synthetic uh, uh, systems. Um, these are just some of the, uh, uh, the, the things that uh, uh, properties of biological uh, 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 machinery, um, but in particular, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about these sort of these two points at the, at the bottom here that's important. And that is, as we've already said, things that uh, are going to work um, as machines at molecular level, they're going to have to work through statistical mechanisms, think of um, momentum, inertia, all those kinds of things are completely irrelevant. And so you can't bring macroscopic machines to the molecular level, but it's not a sensible engineering approach, and they simply can't work. And finally, what biology uses, really uses molecular machines for is to drive chemical systems away from equilibrium where you can get um, uh, uh, task performance. So we've had 30 or 40 years of super molecular chemistry, which has been all about doing things under thermodynamic control, going towards equilibrium. Um, but at equilibrium, there is no function. So biology uses somehow um, uh, molecular machines to drive chemical systems and maintain them away from equilibrium so that um, uh, function can happen. So, yeah, we've uh, worked on this area for uh, 20 odd uh, years. We've often used mechanically interlocked architectures like uh, Stoddart originally uh, pioneered because then you can have these large amplitude. Uh, motions occurring of the components that you can sort of consider isolated from uh, other things. But as you'll see, we don't always use those sorts of uh, architectures. And today I'm just going to talk about a few um, uh, uh, papers, uh, a couple of these ones, uh, this one up here just briefly, and um, um, uh, something that's not uh, uh, appeared in, in print yet, but it's on the seminar. So yeah, about 20 years ago, um, we realized that the molecules that chemists were making at the, the time uh, weren't like, uh, they couldn't do the same sort of things as these amazing uh, motor proteins. They were just sort of switches, even though know, chemists called them motors. They, 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 they weren't. They, wouldn't be, they weren't able to, uh, to do um, progressively and cumulative uh, work. They could just switch between two states, which is completely different to a molecule like Kinesium here. That walked along the track, all the footholds are all exactly the same, and yet this is able to move directionally by catalyzing ATP to uh, ATP, uh, ATP, and in doing so, carry a cargo along the, the track, um, uh, uh, directly along the track. So, we wanted to know how can we make synthetic small molecules that can do those sorts of things? How can we drive systems away from equilibrium? And it turned out that the answers to these questions were already known, they just weren't known to chemists. Uh, but they were known to physicists, uh, and they're called uh, Brownian uh, ratchet mechanisms. And physicists have developed these over, particularly over the last sort of 30 years or so, um, to understand how Brownian particles that undergo stochastic 
motion can be uh, transported directionally. And we just recognize that, uh, uh, of course, the random, uh, random thermal motion within molecules, conformational uh, fluctuations, uh, those are just uh, random fluctuations. So if you can control the directionality of those, that's exactly what you need for a molecular motor. So really all my group did was to take uh, what was known from theoretical physics and apply that to uh, molecular um, uh, uh, design. Um, and it turns out that these are the general solutions to all kinds of molecular uh, motor mechanisms from biology to uh, synthetic systems, linear, rotational, uh, and they give um, chemical processes direction. And as I'll point out at the end, of, well, that, that is obvious really, um, uh, uh, that these sort of things are applicable for giving direction to all kinds of stochastic processes in chemical systems, not just um, molecular motors and, and moving a, a, along tracks. So what's a ratchet mechanism? There are two basic types uh, uh, that are appropriate for, for uh, the chemistry. One of them is called uh, um, uh, an energy ratchet, and there's an information ratchet, which we'll be into a little bit later. So an energy ratchet just consists of um, uh, a repeating periodic surface that's got two different depths of minima and two different heights of uh, maxima, and then that's just periodically uh, repeated. So this little um, brown particle uh, will just sit in, wants to sit in one of the, the lower wells. And then in order to make this move directionally, you just switch it to uh, another potential energy surface where the relative depths here are switched and the relative heights are also switched. You have to do both. And so if you switch to this new potential energy surface, now this particle finds itself in a higher energy state and wants to go down to this lower energy state. So it will go over um, this, uh, this uh, thermally activated over this little energy barrier here. And then if we flip back to the original uh, potential energy surface, so again, we switch the, uh, the relative depths and the relative heights again, we come back to the original potential energy surface. Now it finds itself in a higher well, but it wants to go to one of these two. But the energy barrier to the right is left is lower than the energy barrier to the left. And so uh, it's going to go uh, normally over the lower energy barrier. And again, it's just going to inexorably move from left to right as long as you keep switching between these two potential energy surfaces, then you'll get directional motion of that particle. Um, so that's a, a ratchet mechanism. It's driving this system away from equilibrium. So this particle, if we have another one out there, its average position would be here. But by continually switching between those two potential energy surfaces and doing nothing else except let the particle thermally uh, relax to the local energy minimum, it drives the particle um, directionally. And so um, this is sometimes referred to as kinetic asymmetry because it's just the stochastic motion of this particle, but it's being driven um, in a direction. This was the very first example we did 20 years ago, explaining this process in chemical terms, designing a motor that did that. And this is the latest uh, review we've done in that area. This was a, um, an, an earlier one. So how can you use that in a design? So this is um, uh, uh, an example from a couple of years ago, um, and it's a little bit of a complicated molecule, but I hope it will uh, show the process. So this is based on trying to mimic um, Turing's original idea for uh, an automatic machine for uh, computing uh, molecules. So the, the famous 1936 paper of Turing's that envisaged um, uh, a tape uh, running through a machine which had a reading uh, head, and that reading head moves directionally along the track. So it comes across uh, a series of symbols, and it reads those symbols and it writes um, that information. So this is our, uh, and that's, uh, um, that's actually very similar to how molecules like ribosome work, they're able to read um, information in uh, biology. And so we uh, decided to make a synthetic version of a molecule that could read information from the track, but not rely like um, 
and my presenters on breeding um, uh, RNA base pairs, uh, 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 codons, but um, instead of using a different kind of information. So this is the sort of track that we we use, and this is going to be the reading head. It's going to be put onto the track, and it's going to be directionally through a ratting mechanism, and it's going to read symbols that we encode on the uh, the track. So it um, it moves directionally through the energy ratting mechanism that we just showed. So what we need to do is to switch between two potential energy services, where we switch between the depths of minima and we switch between the heights of, of, of maxima. So the depths of minima switch uh, because there are two different types of binding site on this track. There's uh, amine groups and there are triazolium uh, uh, groups. And when this is a protonated, it's a rhodium site, this is a better binding site for the crowning curve than this one. And when this is deprotonated and it's an amine, it's a worse binding site, so you're switching relative uh, binding affinities just by using pH. But if you remember, we have to also change the relative heights of the maxima, and the maxima here are provided by these steric barriers uh, between the, uh, the symbols that are on, or the binding sites that are on the track. So this, to the right of each uh, uh, compartment, which contains the information, uh, uh, is a disulfide region, that is um, labile in base, but locked in acid. And the bulky group at the other end is a hydrozone group, and that's the opposite effect. So under acidic conditions, this is labile, and this is locked. Uh, uh, under basic conditions, this is locked, and this is labile. So you can switch the maxima, and you can switch the, uh, the, the minima uh, by just changing pH. And then the symbols, and that will allow this ring to spread on here and then move directly down the track by just oscillating the pH. And then um, the symbols here, there is actually stereochemical information, the chiral centers next to the ammonium groups. And here we've got a reading head, a biarrhal group, and it can change its conformation uh, depending upon, it changes its conformation depending upon the chirality of the binding site that it. Uh, binds to, and you can read the chirality out of this conformational change by seeking spectroscopy. So it's, it's complicated, I know, but uh, um, but that's why uh, uh, it can work through a rapid mechanism. So to make this work, you just add a, an acid, the ring threads on here, and uh, this the reading head can sense that this is the best center that adopts a particular conformation that you could read out with seeking spectroscopy. Um, you, it then neutralizes itself after a period of time because it is a, a self um, uh, immolative uh, acid, so it, it actually degrades down into its basic. So then the ring moves to the next side. There's no chiral information here, so you see no CD response. You then add another pulse of fuel to switch back to the first potential energy surface, and the ring will move to here and read whatever that one is in the before. Here. And so this is how this uh, works. This is the potential energy surface changing. This is the CD spectrum. And when it binds on the first one, you see a negative response at 280. So we say that that symbol is encoded minus one. When it moves along there, the CD changes to, to zero. So we've read minus one, zero. When it moves along to here, uh, you can see that the, you have a positive CD response because the chirality of that center, and then it comes off. So that tape was encoded minus one, zero, plus one, and it's just read automatically by the reading head. This one's like, uh, we just changed the stereochemistry here. So when this spreads on, we see negative response. The ring moves again directionality, we're directionally to the rapid mechanism, reads to zero. And then when it gets onto this side, it all goes to minus one again. We see a negative readout. So you can, this reading head is reading the, the stereochemical information that's encoded in sequence on that track through that stereochemistry. Uh, and it's not just one machine operating on its own, it's all of the machines doing exactly the same thing, with billions and billions and billions of them, all at exactly the same uh, time. So that's the sort of thing you can do with ratchet mechanisms. Um, and so that's great. That really works. 
it's, it's a ratchet mechanism, it's reading information. Um, but it's not how biology, that's still not how biology works. So ratchet that we just shown works by switching oscillating pH back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that's not how biology works. Um, this motor protein is a catalyst that's catalyzing um, the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP, and it's using that action of catalysis to actually move up and down the track, and that's the key to all of uh, uh, all of biology. But if that's true, oh, and so that uses uh, a, there's a, another type of, of mechanism. Um, which is appropriate for that, where you don't have to um, uh, keep oscillating the, uh, uh, the reaction conditions. And this dates back to uh, the maxwell Beeman thought experiment, which I uh, imagine people in this room will be more familiar than uh, most chemists. Uh, but uh, just to recap, uh, Maxwell, when he was coming up, uh, when the laws of thermodynamics were being formulated, he realized that there was a, um, a paradox between um, the kinetic theory of heat that he involved to come up with and, and the, the laws of thermodynamics. He illustrated it in the uh, thought experiment where you've got a box which contains um, slow moving or cold particles shown in blue and fast moving or, or hot particles shown in red. The being here controls a trap door and it lets through fast moving or hot particles from the left to the right uh, or slow moving or cold particles from the right to the left. But it won't let through slow moving particles from left to right or hot particles in the way. And therefore, the being can sort the particles into slow moving or cold on one side, fast moving or hot on the other. Uh, Maxwell realized that you could get a temperature gradient out of that. But if this is a fraction, a frictionless trapdoor, it looks like the being needed to spend no energy to get this temperature gradient. But you can use the temperature gradient to drive a turbine. And so that would break the second law of thermodynamics. You get work for nothing. And it took physicists some hundred years to realize that the, the processing of information to know when to open and close the, uh, the trap door uh, that cost energy and so you, can, you can't break the second law of thermodynamics in this way. But from what, what our point of view of trying to design molecular machines, this is really interesting because we went from the situation at equilibrium to a situation at out of equilibrium. And that's exactly what molecular uh, machines do. So that's a molecular motor mechanism. Uh, so if we can process information uh, in this way by adding energy, uh, so not to break the second law, uh, we should be able to make a molecular motor. And again, 15 years or whatever it was uh, ago, we made a molecule that would uh, uh, do that. Um, it drives the uh, position of this uh, uh, ring from its equilibrium uh, uh, position uh, um, uh, away from uh, from equilibrium. This is a gate. So if this is a uh, if this is a, a trap in the transform, the ring can move between both sides. If it's in the cis form, it's uh, closed. Uh, the gate's closed, so it gets knocked on one side or the other. And it turns out that you need to have um, two chemical reactions in order to drive the ring away from its equilibrium uh, value, because uh, you need uh, this is a photosensitizer. So when a photon hits that, it, 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 uh, allowed, it transfers energy to the gate to either open or close it. Uh, so, but, so you can use that to open the gate, but once the ring has gone to the other side, you need to then close the gate so that it doesn't uh, just go straight back. So you actually need to have two chemical reactions um, that depend uh, on the position of this ring in order to make this uh, kind of reaction that's called a, the information ratchet mechanism. I'm glossing over it because it's only um, just to explain where this came from, um, uh, this, this, this concept. So this really uh, works. This is the equilibrium uh, distribution of the ring on the track. This is the amount of gate that's um, open. So when the gate is completely open, uh, that's the equilibrium position. And if you shine light on this molecule, as you close more and more of the gate, you still have an equilibrium distribution of those two bits because you only have one uh, photochemical reaction. It's possible here. Uh, you can't close the gate after this ring is uh, moved. So to close the gate, you have to add an external photosensitizer, which will allow that to close when the ring's on the other side. 
And if you do that, you can drive the ring position away from its equilibrium value with uh, uh, and have more of the ring on, on the side. So it's a bit like a, a molecular. Thing. So this is first ever spirit molecular pump, and it works through this information ratchet mechanism. Um, however, this is still not how biology works because this is working uh, with light. And uh, the, this system works with light. That's not how biology works. It's working through catalysis. And even though Nobel Prizes have been given for um, the uh, for the structures of motor uh, 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 proteins, um, uh, people, because they use so complicated these structures, people really didn't understand how catalysis can allow you to uh, harvest energy, that the transduce energy to drive systems away from the equilibrium. But now we understand how to make ratchet mechanisms, um, we can answer these, we can build molecules that can answer these fundamental questions. How can you the action of catalysis just accelerate the chemical reaction due to directional motion, like it's happening here? And how does the energy released from a catalyzed chemical reaction enable work to be done by the catalyst, which is what's happening with all these kinds of proteins? So, yeah, so we built, uh, um, yeah, eight years ago, uh, a PhD student in my group, Miriam Wilson, who now works in Andy Cooper's group as a, um, as a, or is associated with it, um, uh, some sort of technology transfer person at Liverpool. She made this uh, uh, motor. And it works in exactly the same way as the Maxwell Beeman light driven system, but this is a rotary motor and it's working to a chemical um, system. So the blocking group that that system comes to, I was showing before, I was showing you before, that's played out by uh, having this bulky group either added or taken away um, from the, the track. And that restricts the movement of this ring between these two uh, binding sites. So uh, what happens is that when these are in place, the three can't move, but then let's say that this one falls off under the uh, reaction conditions so that you uh, uh, so that the ring can actually move now around in this direction. Um, as well as having conditions where this can fall off, you also need to have conditions where uh, it can add again um, by adding a fuel that will add the um, uh, the blocking group back in uh, back in place. And uh, 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 this uh, binding site is close to uh, this site, and this binding site is far away from this site. So if this ring is here, uh, it hin certainly hinders the attack of the fuel at this site. Uh, and so the reaction, the restoring of that group happens quicker if the ring is further, uh, this ring is further away. So it will tend to, uh, to go here. And then if we remove the uh, blocking group on this on this side there, exactly the same thing will happen and it will uh, move di directionally. So in this way, as long as you keep adding fuel so that it can replace this group that's coming off, then this little blue ring will rotate directionally around the larger ring. Now it's a bit hard to appreciate exactly how this works, but when we published the, uh, the paper, one of the referees said that um, this molecule is like this Wallace and Gromit cartoon um, uh, where uh, Wallace, which is the, uh, uh, Gromit, which is the, the dog, is putting down a track in front of this uh, train. And the referee points out um, that our molecule is like that, but at the same time, you need to remove the track from behind the train so they can't go uh, backwards, and we like that analogy of the referee. So we had a, a little uh, model thing of our molecule acting like the Wallace, Wallace cartoon. So these are the binding sites uh, here. Those are the blocking groups. That blocking group in place uh, corresponds to the, the track being removed. This going down in track going down in front corresponds to the uh, blocking group being removed. Uh, and we like the picture so much. We had a little movie made of our molecule working like the Wallace and Gromit cartoon. So the breaking of the bulk group corresponds to the uh, trap being in place. That coming in corresponds to the trap being removed. As long as that process continues, the train will rotate clockwise 
uh, around the, the track. So it's obviously cool. this goes on through the three hours. <laughs> that really works. So this was um, yeah. Oh, you see that in this fuel. The little blue ring will spin round and round. So that was the first autonomous chemically fueled small molecule molecular motor. And uh, the blue ring rotates as long as unspent fuel is uh, present. And that's exactly the same way that motor proteins are powered in biology. They catalyze ATP hydrolysis. This interlock molecule is, is catalyzing the hydrolysis of the ethmol and the chloride. Um, but because we designed this molecule, we understand exactly how it uh, works. And so for the first time, we've got an example that explains how catalysis can generate directional dynamics and how the energy uh, released by the catalysis of this reaction can be transduced uh, by the catalyst to allow uh, work to be done. Um, so that was great. So that's the, the uh, a chemically fueled molecular motor, but it's not the first um, uh, rotational molecular motor, of course. That's uh, uh, this example of Beringa's, the light driven one that we talked about um, early. And this is fantastic, of course it is, but it's um, also extremely limited uh, in that this is uh, only possible to do rotation only. You can't design something based on all the thin isomerization to do linear. Uh, molecular motion, which is what almost all, uh, most all, the most vast majority of those proteins of biology do. Also, this is limited to rotation around double bonds. You can't do single bonds, triple bonds, supramolecular structures, mechanical structures. It's just things with uh, double bonds. And then, most importantly of all, this is powered by light. And um, so, the way that this works is that. Um, uh, you excite it with uh, light to uh, this excited state. And then in this excited state, undergoes a helix inversion, um, which is thermodynamically uh, uh, downhill. So the use of light breaks microscopic uh, reversibility. And that's why you can get directionality through this uh, uh, conformational change. And that mechanism is not applicable to any other kind of energy source. So you can't design chemically driven motors that will work in this kind of uh, way, because it's only through using light to create micros microscopic reversibility that you can get this kind of directionality. So the way that this motor works, it's got nothing to do with anything to do with biological machinery whatsoever. You can't infer anything uh, from this sort of uh, approach uh, about uh, but now we know how to make lactic mechanisms which can work for rotation, translation, any kind of purely uh, system. We thought we'll uh, design such a, a system. So a couple of years ago, uh, we designed a chemically fueled um, uh, molecule, not to do with catenates, just that will rotate around this single uh, bond. So the way that this works is that these two acid groups on the biallyl molecule here can't move past each other these, uh, for steric reasons. They're too, um, they're, they're, they're too uh, big. So, um, however, uh, uh, if you uh, react it with a carbodiamide, uh, which will produce this urea, you'll form a anhydride. And in the anhydride form, these carbonyl groups can twist uh, around and pass each other although it can't go back the other way. So this accesses a different set of rotary dynamics to, to this one, which allows the carbonyl group to burn past each other. And if you then hydrolyze this uh, in water in the same um, uh, in the same pot, you'll go back to the, um, the acid. So the other feature that we have here is that these two um, acid conformers are enantiomers of each other. This one has the uh, acid group going into the back of the board. This has the acid group going forward, uh, out of the board. So these are enantiomeric uh, conformations. So because these conformations are enantiomeric, if you use a chiral carbonate, it will react faster with one of them than the other. So we choose the chirality here so that this one reacts faster than that one. So it's 
So when we're down here with these just simply exchanging, that one reacts faster than this one. And so we go up where that black line is dark and not up here. That gray one is slower than that. So then we'll go up to here. And then uh, these two will just forget. These two complements are again enantiomers of each other. So this will just simply flip back and forth between these two. Uh, and instead of just using water, we can use a chiral pyridine group to open uh, this. And because this is chiral, we can choose the enantiomer, the, the particular enantiomer of this, which will open this one from behind, not that one. So we will go down this side, not down that side. So we will get directional rotation of the rotor around the stator by, uh, by reacting with the carbodiamide and producing urea and then being hydrolyzed back to here. So in other words, this dye acid is catalyzing the, uh, the uh, conversion of the carbodiamide to the urea. And during that catalytic cycle, it's rotating clockwise, as we've shown there, around the, uh, this cycle. So how do we know that that works? Um, I'll, skip over, I'll skip over this because it's, uh, it, it, it works. <laughs> Um, so this is what actually happens. So the acid groups uh, won't uh, pass each other uh, until you add the, but when you add the chemical fuel, it will react faster with the acid group when it's from the back. And now this carbonyl group can get past the other one. And it'll just ring flip back and forth, but we have this chiral back group, which will uh, attack preferentially from the back to complete the directional 360 rotation. So as long as you keep adding um, the carbon in my group, you get directional rotation. So yeah, so the, the motor is a catalyst from fuel to waste reaction. Uh, because you can just um, uh, choose the chirality of this fuel, you can make it rotate the other way around if you prefer by just using the enantiomeric fuel system, the motor will rotate in the opposite direction, so you can make it rotate in either direction if you want. It works through this maxwell beamer like mechanism. Uh, yeah, and it's an example of confirmation of flexibility catalysis. And again, because we know exactly how that works because we designed it, again, we, we have an example that shows how catalysis can generate directional motion and how energy can be transduced by a catalyst in this way. Well, I keep saying that energy is being transduced and work is being done. But um, it's not apparent from that how that happens. So Peng Lai in the audience um, made uh, something where you can see work being done. So Peng Lai took the motor that we've just seen and made it uh, put polymer strands in it so that they could be uh, uh, polymerized, and that makes the gel. So this gel has these motor molecules embedded in it, and if you fuel those motor uh, the, the gel. Uh, with the um, uh, with the with the chiral fuel, then the motors twist round, uh, 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 cause the uh, uh, entangle the polymer chain and cause the gel uh, to contract. So, yeah, it goes down to about uh, sixty five percent of uh, of its original size because of the motors uh, uh, twirling all in the same direction. So it causes the uh, twists and strands around each other and generates a force that contracts the, uh, the gel and allows work to be done. So, um, and you can, it doesn't matter, uh, as I say, you can rotate the, uh, the motors in either uh, direction, depending on the chirality of the fuel that you use. Uh, and as long as you only use one chirality of fuel, doesn't matter whether you rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise, uh, the gel will still contract to exactly the same um, uh, uh, degree. Um, um, so this is uh, really doing work and generating a, a, a force through this action of catalysis uh, by the motors of the fuel to waste reaction. That's what's giving the energy that's being transduced to generate a mechanical force uh, to contract this gel. It's exactly the same kind of process as uh, myosin, the, uh, the motors in your muscle, they generate a force by, um, uh, uh, by catalyzing ATP to ATP and transducing that energy to generate a force. These are linear motors, not rotary ones, but the 
principle is the same, but this has an electoral weight of 450,000 and the 517 atoms, the largest atoms in this uh, artificial electoral uh, motion. Um, when you get down to, uh, when it's it, it, it shrunk to 65 or 70% of its original size, the catalysis still continues, but it won't shrink anymore because you've reached the stall force of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the motor. So um, uh, uh, we can understand what that actually means in terms of conformational process. What it means is that uh, uh, the rotation of the motor is no longer uh, directional at, at that uh, point. And that's because the untwisting force of the strands is sufficient to uh, stop that process being favored over this one. This um, uh, uh, twisting, untwisting energy, twisting it in favor of this complement. So that um, uh, we have an understanding then of what even the stall force of these sorts of things is. Uh, we get property changes in uh, through the, the energy that's transduced to make these entanglements. Uh, this is the elastic storage uh, modulus, uh, modulus uh, uh, G prime, and it's uh, about five times different, uh, five times more in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, pure contracted gel. And the elastic modulus is proportional to the number of entanglements in the uh, polymer. Uh, 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 in the polymer material. So as the, uh, all that we've done is, to, uh, is, in, is, is introduce more entanglements by the twisting of the motors. Uh, this tells us that there are about five times more entanglements produced by the action of the motors. So each motor is rotating about five times um, to get down to the stall force of the, uh, of the motors. And so this is a measurement that directly affects it's the structural changes that are occurring at the nanoscale in the gel. That's to do with the number of entanglements that's uh, occurring now. Uh, we can also we also see a change in Young's uh, modulus. So if you do tensile tests on the gel before and after uh, contraction, uh, we see um, that the pure contracted gel uh, is stiffer. And so that's a measurement, that's a, a, a bulk property measurement. So you're seeing a bulk effect of, on the material by the action of the, uh, of the motion, of the chemical reaction. And you can even see things at the, uh, the micron level by uh, AFM. So this is the, the gel before it's fueled. Uh, and after it's contracted, you can see these micro, uh, micron sized holes have appeared uh, in the gel. And that's because when you twist the the, the strands around, they gather material um, from the other ones and open uh, from the other surrounding areas and open up uh, actual gaps. And if you then re expand the gel by cooling it with um, an achiral fuel, so it just allows the uh, groups, uh, the groups part of it again, you see that these are reduced or, or disappear. So that's direct observation of um, microscopic structural changes that are occurring in that case. And because you can uh, rotate the motors either clockwise or counterclockwise, uh, you can do this nice experiment that you uh, fuel them first of all with the S, -fuel, S fueling system that twists the, the, the motors uh, counterclockwise. And so you see this contraction uh, of the gel uh, down to its um, uh, smallest size. Uh, we then wash out the S reagents and the S waste. And we refuel it with the opposite uh, handedness of the fuel. So that twists the motors in the opposite direction. So it starts to unwind the strands. And you see that the gel then expands. Uh, and then once uh, uh, most of the, the strands have um, unwound, uh, if you, uh, as there's still fuel present, rotating uh, the motors in that new direction, it then starts to contract. Uh, 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 again, so this is um, yeah, this is filling it with the the uh, counterclockwise rotating motor, so you see the gel contraction. Then we wash that out the S fuel and replace it with the R fuel, and this is what happens. First, it expands, and then it starts to contract again as you're uh, uh, winding it in the uh, now the clockwise direction. Uh, so that's that. Uh, 
So notice some um, two things that, oh, again, you can see this by um, AFM, so that uh, uh, when it's contracted, it's down here. Then when it's re-expanded to its maximum size, you see these gaps are gone. And then when you get down to here, they've appeared again. The, uh, the holes are, uh, in the gel have appeared again. And note that the re-expansion here is much faster than either of the contraction events. And that's because the expansion is promoted uh, by the untwisting power of the uh, twisted strands. They're driving the uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, faster rotation of the uh, 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 an unwinding of the actual uh, uh, strand. So that's actually a chemical threat that brought back from the energy that was transduced from the original reaction. Okay, I've used up way too, too much of my time, so I'll skip over this other than to say that that's not the only way that you can use racket mechanisms and chemical fueling. You can use it to do uh, to drive chemical reactions again, as is done in, in biology. We're used to just taking reactants, making it a certain product or certain other product. But with radically, you can get it away from that paradigm and use some of the energy from the fuel to drive a chemical reaction. So this feels all the reaction doesn't go, it's energetically uphill. But if you fuel it with the fuel reaction that we saw before, you can actually get some of the energy from that reaction and transduce it in order to form this other chemical reaction here. So, yeah. Okay, so the take home message is catalysis isn't just synthesis. We make and use about half our body weight in ATP every day. We don't defecate half our body weight because the ATP that we produce is recycled to ATP, but we're making and using half our body weight in this chemical fuel every day. And that's because biology uses catalysis to transduce chemical energy to perform every task in the, uh, 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 the cell, not just um, molecular machine, but every other chemical process. And the key to doing this is kinetic asymmetry. It's the dynamic counterpart of structural asymmetry that we're all completely familiar with, with chirality. But kinetic asymmetry is what drives all these processes completely ubiquitous in biology and it's surely well and it's not used by chemists at all um so john marie lane in his uh, nice book on supermetric chemistry in chapter 10 has this book uh, this diagram showing uh the difference between chemistry and, and biology so uh biology uh isn't at all diverse you've only really got 20 amino acids everything has to work in water at room temperature uh, uh, very few elements are available, and yet it's highly, highly complex. Synthetic chemistry, on the other hand, we've got the whole of the periodic table, we can use any conditions we like from minus uh, 200 degrees C up to uh, uh, six, you know, up to whatever you want, you can exclude oxygen, um, uh, and yet it's nowhere near the complexity of biology. And Lane has his arrow, but he doesn't say what's in here. Uh, and I think that this is non equilibrium chemistry. And if that's true, then this is, means ratchet mechanisms. And if that's ratchet mechanisms, that means catalysis and kinetic asymmetry. I think that's what fills in that funny uh, gap. Okay, I uh, apologize for uh, going on too long. Uh, I haven't done any of this. I'd like to thank, in particular, uh, Ping Lai in the audience for doing that fantastic work on the uh on the uh the gel and all the rest of our uh, group thanks <clears throat> thank you <laughs> thank you very much david for the brilliant talk uh, let me stop uh the recording and